Good morning, Ignite. My name is Sam. Thank you for joining us for service today. Before we get started, I'll say a quick prayer for all of us. Uh, dear God, we just thank you for this day. Uh, we just thank you uh, just for getting us through some turbulent weeks. And we just pray, Lord, that you just continue to be with us. Just uh, We just give this time to you right now, God. In the same pray. Amen.
Lord, for this time that we have. Just to think about how you love us so, Lord. Regardless of where we are and how we're feeling, Lord, your love is always constant. And it's when we feel stressed or busy, frustrated, that we need to lean into your love the most, Lord. So I just pray as we listen forward with this message, Lord, that you give us hearts to really be aware of how much you love us, Lord, to put aside everything else that's been happening just to focus on you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Before we get started with the rest of service, we want to spend some time in corporate prayer. We're going to have three prayer topics for today. The first one is in relation to the increase in hate crimes against Asians and Asian Americans. And of course, the shooting that happened in Atlanta the last week. So we want to just pray for peace. We want to pray for healing and comfort for all victims. Uh, we also want to pray for protection moving forward. Uh, the next prayer point is about the shooting that happened in Colorado this past week. Again, we want to pray for peace. We want to pray for protection. We also want to pray for comfort for all the victims. Uh, more importantly for these first two prayer topics, we also want to pray against the higher powers that are at work here. We want to pray against uh, principalities and any demonic spirits that are trying to cause division and trying to uh, kill, steal, and destroy in our communities. So let's pray against those. And then on a lighter note, our third prayer point is uh, to praise the Lord and just be grateful that we are opening back up into Orange Tier for Santa Clara County. So let's just pray that it'll just continue to go well and that it'll happen in a safe manner. So let's all spend some time in prayer and then I'll close for us. Uh, Father God, we just come before you, Lord. We know that there's just so much suffering and uh, hurt happening in the world right now. And uh, especially in just two communities, God, in Atlanta and in Boulder. And we just pray, God, that your hand would just be on all the families that have been uh, unjustly hurt by these incidents, God. We just pray, Lord, over uh, your hand, for your hand to just be over this whole scenario and this whole situation. We pray for your hand to just come bring peace and comfort to these families. God, we just pray, Lord, against any uh, demonic spirit and any principality that is against us right now, Lord, any spirit that's trying to cause division, we just rebuke it, God. We rebuke it in your name. Lord, we also just pray for uh, the violence and the against Asians right now, God. We just pray, Lord, that your peace and your hand would be over this whole scenario, God. We just pray again that you just watch our families, our loved ones, and you just be with us as we all uh, suffer and are grieving during this time, I pray, Lord, that you just come and comfort us as well, God. Lord, we also just want to thank you that Santa Clara County is opening back up, that we're in orange tier now. God, we just pray for your continued hand in as we face this pandemic and as we are slowly recovering from it. God, we just pray, Lord, that you uh, would just help us and help the county and the officials do this whole transition safely and in a prudent manner. And Lord, we just thank you and we just give you everything. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As always, if you're a newcomer here at Ignite, please visit our website, 
igniterlcc.com slash connect. There you'll find a form and someone from our hospitality team will reach out and uh, put you in touch with the life group or wherever else you would like to get plugged into. If you would like to give to Ignite at this time, please also visit our website, igniterlcc.com slash giving. Uh, our first announcement for today is Easter is next week, so that means all of us that have been fasting, we're almost there. Please stay strong. It's only one more week left. Uh, speaking of Easter, we do have Good Friday service this upcoming Friday. Uh, this is going to be a joint service for all of the River of Life family, and we will also be partaking in communion that night. So if you would like to join us, please prepare what you think best represents communion in your own home. There's also going to be Easter service next Sunday as well. Following today's service, we also have an Empower You seminar. Uh, the topic is going to be mental health during COVID-19. So we actually have a uh, psychologist and mental health professor who is going to go over different skills and exercises that we can all implement right now just to kind of maintain and grow our mental health and our mental well-being during this time of social distancing and isolation. Uh, next week, we have our men's and women's ministry events. So the women's ministry event is happening at 7.30 on Saturday. The men's event will start at 8 p.m. on Saturday. All the links can be found in the description box below or on our website on the Happening Now page. Last but not least, uh, we will be starting a River of Life English-wide prayer meeting every month. This is going to be the first Tuesday of every month at 7.30. This link can be found in the description box below or on our website on the Happening Now page. Our Ignite monthly prayer meeting will be moved to the third Wednesday of every month. So we're gonna announce this probably for one or two months, but after that, it'll just be assumed that we all know this schedule. But of course, you can always find it in the bulletin if you scroll down to the bottom of the newsletter. Other than that, please help me welcome up Pastor Chang. Good morning, brothers and sisters. It is so good to come to your home again and to worship with you and to share the Word of God with you. And before I do that, I'd like to have all of us to spend a few moments of silent prayer and to pray for the families of the victims of Colorado shooting and the Atlanta shooting, as well as the family of the Asian American community, especially the elderly who has been attacked lately. And just spend a few moments to pray for them and ask the Lord of all comfort to comfort them. So let's spend about 30 seconds in silent prayer. He has made a father of all comfort, comfort all those who are hurting in this time of grief. Amen. Good Friday is just five days away. I know that many of you are fasting and praying. Uh, during this season of Lent, I think it's a wonderful time for us to fast and pray and especially to spend time and to think about our Lord Jesus Christ and to draw near to God and especially to focus on Jesus Christ, the one who crucified and died for us on the cross. And today I want to share with you the passion of the Christ, the suffering and the death of Jesus Christ. I'm going to go through a few uh, passages in the Bible and in every single one of those passages uh, passages is very helpful for you to spend time during your time of fasting and praying to meditate on the Lord and how he really suffered and died for us. You may come to a question and ask, uh, why did Christ have to suffer? Why did he have to die on the cross? And for whom did he die on the cross? And today we're going to look at, first of all, the prophet Isaiah, 700 years before Jesus was born. The Lord has spoken through prophet Isaiah. And to tell us about this coming Messiah, what, what did he do and uh, what will he do and uh, how will he do all that for us. And so let's first of all look at Isaiah chapter 53 verses 4 and 5. Isaiah chapter 53 verses 4 and 5. Here he said, Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we consider him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted, but he was pierced. For our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. Here, the passage of the Bible, uh, the, the prophet was talking about the coming Messiah. 
the coming Christ, even before Christ was born, several hundred years before that, the Lord has already prophesied to us this coming Messiah will come and take upon himself all our suffering and pain. And especially I underline this word hours, there are altogether four hours in this passage. And first of all, he say he took up our pain and bore our suffering. And the Messiah Jesus Christ, who knew no sin, but because of us, became sin for us. He was righteous, and because of his righteousness, he can die for the unrighteous. Therefore, he bore our pain and our suffering, and also he was punished and by God. We thought he was punished by God, stricken by him, uh, and afflicted. And then the, the third, I would say, he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. So you can imagine when Jesus Christ was hung on the cross, he was never thought of himself. All he was thinking is, all, all, all that was in his mind is us, our pain, our suffering, our transgressions, our iniquities. He did not suffer for himself. It is because of our sin. It is because of our pain and our suffering, because of our rebellion, because of our pride, our self-centeredness. Therefore, he was crucified on the cross. It is for us that he was crushed. It was for us that he was pierced. And so we need to understand how deep and how wide is the love of God. You know, this uh, verse is really a very important verse for us to meditate, meditate upon, especially during, during this season of Lent, so that we may understand how much God really loves us. And so the first point I want to make is, Jesus bore all our suffering to reconcile us to God. Jesus bore upon himself all our suffering to reconcile us to God. The Bible tells us all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The consequences, the consequences of sin is separations. Separation from God and then separation from one another. And therefore, Jesus has to took upon himself all our suffering, all our pain in order to bring us back to God. And we know that Jesus, when he was on the earth, you know, he like became the bridge for us to return to God. And how did he do that? And how did he really suffer for us? And I think all the suffering that Jesus bore on the cross, one of the greatest suffering that I can imagine, is not the hurting words by the priests or by the soldiers or by the passerby. You know, they ridicule him, they mock him, and that you are the son of God, you can save yourself. Even one of the robbers that crucified together with him on the left and the right, ridicule Jesus. Hey, you can save others. Why can't you save yourself? And all this, I think, is in, compar is in comparison with the pain of separations. Therefore, he was forsaken and so that we can be accepted. How do we know that it was so painful for Jesus? And so let's turn to another passage that is recorded in Mark Gospel, chapter 15, verses 33 to 34. Mark Gospel, chapter 15. Here the Bible says, At noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And you know, for three hours and at three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lema sabatani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus has spoken seven words while he was hung on a cross. And among all these seven words, I think the most painful of all is this cry. And therefore the Bible says he cried out in a loud voice. You can imagine Jesus was already bleeding to, to death and he was, hung, he, was, he was hung on a cross. Every movement he had to catch a breath. You can imagine he, he ushered out all his energy and, and, and he cried out in a loud voice and said, Eloi, Eloi, leba samatani. And so we know that before this happened, from noon until three, about three hours, the whole land was filled with darkness. The sun stopped shining for three hours. What does it symbolize? Symbolize the sin of the whole world. Your sin. And my sin at that time was rested upon our Lord Jesus Christ. So darkness was symbolizing the power of darkness, the power of sin, and the power of death. It was engulfing the whole land. If you were there at that time, it must be very scary. Suddenly, the sun should be the brightest, noon to three o'clock. But it was, it, it, was, it, was, it was darkness, no longer any light. And the second observation that we see is Jesus cried out in a loud voice. It was a cry of anguish of the soul. 
and he cried out in his mother tongue. You know, the Holy Spirit and, you know, preserved this, Arab, uh, this, uh, this cry of Jesus in Aramaic. You know, Eloi, Eloi, Lapa, Lema, Sabatani is in Aramaic. Aramaic was Jesus' mother's tongue. And then things to preserve and to tell us, and uh, this is the deepest sense of Jesus' anguish of soul. So when you are really in pain, especially in the deepest pain of your soul, you don't speak other languages. You just cry out in your mother tongue. That's what Jesus did. He cried out in his mother tongue, Eloi, Eloi, Lema, Sapatani. And the, the, the uh, Bible writers, you know, the, the Gospel of Mark as well, Gospel of Matthew had to translate this and say, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You know, it's interesting. The cry of Jesus here is saying, My God, my God. You know, in three times, in the seven last words of Jesus Christ on the cross, he addressed the Father. Okay, but two times it was addressed as Father. Only this time, he addressed his father as my God, my God. As if like you call someone Mr. or your daddy Mr. instead of daddy. You know, there was this alienation, there was this distance between him and God the Father at the time. Why? Because of all our sin and all our pain, all our suffering, all our transgression, iniquity was upon him. The whole darkness was upon him. And our God the Father who was righteous, and he will not regard sin as no sin. And therefore, when the sin of the whole world was upon his only son, Jesus Christ, this father has to turn his face away from his son and not to look at him because the Holy God cannot look at the sin of the world. Therefore, the whole world was in darkness. The whole land was in darkness. So Jesus was forsaken and so that we can be accepted. And therefore, we are no longer being forsaken. Just like Jesus said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Why? Because he was forsaken for us. You know, I don't know if you have an experience of being forsaken. You know, I have once experienced it is uh, something that I cannot, I can never forget. It was still in 1986. After my graduation from the School of Architecture, I decided to go into full-time ministry. But my parents, they were strongly objecting to the idea. Hey, you can be an architect now. Why do you want to go into full-time Christian ministry to become a poor pastor, poor minister? So I struggle, but I call on to my conviction that this is a call of the Lord. And so finally, after three months of negotiating, or fighting, you know, imagine uh, negotiating with my parents. Finally, my father said to me, okay, you can go on your, go, you can go on, go your way now, but don't ever ask us for anything at all. At that time, I felt deep in my heart that my father, you know, my parents have forsaken me. I feel so lonely. I feel, you know, so sad, you know, they have forsaken me. They, don't, they, they, they no longer want to care for me. Jesus felt even more. Because while Jesus was on the earth for three, 33 and a half years, he was never at one time separated from his heavenly father. But now for our sin, he was separated on the cross. Just look at this, this picture. This picture of Jesus on the cross. The whole land was filled with darkness. And Jesus was hung on the cross and he cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Look at this picture and imagine the suffering that our Lord Jesus Christ has to go through in order to reconcile us to God and so that we can be accepted by God, no longer being forsaken, no longer feel alone or lonely because there is this Father in heaven and Jesus Christ will love you and love you to the very end. And we know that by his death on the cross, Jesus has, became, has become the bridge for us to return back to God. And so he was, by his death on the cross, he has, uh, he, has, he has accomplished the greatest thing that no priest or no prophet has ever accomplished. And the Bible tells us at the time of Jesus' death, the curtain that separated from the holies and holies and the holy was torn from top to bottom into half. That God, through Jesus Christ, has made a new and a living way so that we can come back to God. What does it mean? That He has broken down the wall of separations. That He has destroyed the wall of hostility. You know, when sin separates us not just from God and from one another, it also creates hostile environment between human beings. Hostile environment between us and the people around us. That's why we see a lot of 
you know, unpleasant thing lately has been happening around us, especially among the Asian uh, American community. And there is this hostility. There is this war. But Jesus Christ, when he died on the cross, he has broken down every war. He has destroyed the war of hostility. And so when Paul, when he wrote to the church in Ephesus, at that time, there was this church of many few with the Jewish people. There are some uh, the Greek, you know, some you know, Hellenistic uh, people that are Greek people. So they are not in good terms. But Paul mentioned this in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 14 to 15, and tells us what Christ has done on the cross. It's a very important pa passage for us to look at. So let's look at Ephesians chapter 2, verses 14 to 16. For he himself, talking about Jesus Christ, is our peace. Shalom. Who has made the two groups one has, and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. Who are the two groups? The Greeks and the Jews, the Gentile and the chosen people of God. Who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. Verse 15, by setting aside in his flesh, that means to the, on the cross, the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new man or one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace, shalom again. And in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. What Paul is saying is that when Jesus Christ died on the cross, he died for the Jews and the Greek. He dies for the black, the white, the Asians, the brown, and anywhere in between. He died for us all. He has broken down the world of hostility because God has created us all in His image that we are all equal in the sight of God. But Satan doesn't like that. And therefore, he wants to create a world of hostility between different groups of people. Even though he knows that this division is no longer there because Jesus Christ has broken down the world of hostility. But he lied to us. He lied to us by telling us, hey, we are better than the other people. Hey, we are superior than the other group of people. Therefore, we have a lot of hatred among different groups of people. We have, you know, unjust things happen, you know, even to, 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 to minority community, you know, in our area. And so we realize that, hey, Satan wants to destroy what God has already accomplished. God has destroyed this world of hostility. And therefore, we can come together as one new man as one new community. This is very important for us to know, very important for us to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ so that people will know, hey, we are all as one in Christ. You know, I have witnessed this so clearly, you know, in the year of 2015, about six years, six, six years ago when I visited Israel for the second time. In the November of 2015, I spent 12 days in Israel and live in Mount Carmel, and Mount Carmel, I think it may ring a bell to you, it was on that mount, certain part of that mountain, where the prophet Elijah killed 400 prophets of Baal. So I lived there with the Jews and the uh, so Arabs, and for 12 days, amazing. I want you to see this couple of pictures. First of all, look at the picture, number, uh, picture of Mount Carmel. Mount Carmel, this is a Mount Carmel assembly. This is the One New Man Church. Oh, they are so happy worshipping the Lord together. Do you know who are the people that who are worshipping together in this Kamil assembly? And our church, by the way, are, are also helping financially this church in, in Mount Kamil, Israel. There were Jews and Greek. There were Jews and Arabs. They are worshipping together under one roof. Can you imagine? You know, Arabs has been you know, an enemy to the Jewish people for hundreds and even thousands of years. But now in Mount Carmel Assembly, we see them worshipping together. And the next picture, the next picture, you see the uh, worship team, the one who played on the keyboard, Pastor Yosef, he was here before and he even shared his testimony. Now, he was really, at that time, marginalized by the Jewish community. He was really, you know, despised and even persecuted by the Jewish community. But later on, when he became a Christian and he started the church there, hey, how God reconciled them. He was the Arab Christians having his own church now. And but before that, he was joining this community assembly, worshipping together with the Jewish people. One new man. That's what Jesus, Paul says, one new humanity. 
and thus making peace. And in his body, Jesus Christ, he has reconciled all of us to himself. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, we need to share this message of reconciliation, message of peace, message of shalom with the people around us, with your African-American neighbours, for my case, with my Korean neighbour, with my Caucasian neighbours, to tell them that, hey, Jesus Christ has, has broken down and destroyed every war of hostility. We can live in peace because Jesus Christ is our peace. Amen. And second point I want to make is that Jesus suffered willingly to set us free. You know, this is very important for us to understand that. The Son of God, the Word became flesh, came to this world. You can imagine all the suffering that he has to go through for this God of the universe here to become so small and so minute that he had to stay in the wombs of Mary for nine, ten months. Can you imagine Jesus had to suffer in order to set us free? Because we are all under the bondage of sin since the Garden of Eden, the fall of man. And therefore, we are all under the bondage. And so Jesus, he had to come and set us free. You know, this is very important for us to understand. Why did he do that? Did anyone force him to do that? No. And let's look at a couple of verses in John chapter 10, verses 11 and then verse 18. Here the Bible tells us, I am the good shepherd. It was Jesus saying, I am the good shepherd. And the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And in verse 18, no one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord, talking about his own life. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I receive from my Father. Very important for us to take notes. Here Jesus said, I have authority to lay it down, to lay down my life and authority to take it out again. In other words, when God the Father had this master plan of saving the world and saving all of us to reconcile us, to set us free, He has a plan. The plan is to let His only Son, Jesus Christ, to come to this world, to die for our sin, to reconcile us back to God and to make us peace with God. But God the Father leave that decision with His Son, Jesus Christ. That's why Jesus said, I have the authority to lay it down. No one can take it from me. In other words, while Jesus was on the earth, no one, no Roman authority, no Roman soldier or official, and no power at all can take, down, uh, can take the life of Jesus. But He said, I lay it down of my own accord. Jesus suffered willingly to set you and I free. Without his own permission, no one can even harm a hair on his head. That's what Jesus is saying. He laid down his life willingly because he has authority to lay it down and has authority to take it out again. And so we know that this is a decision that Jesus had made. But it was never an easy decision. It was a very hard decision that Jesus had to make. You say, well, Jesus had to make a decision in a very difficult way. Yes. How do we know that? Remember in the Garden of Gethsemane? So Jesus had to agonize over the decisions. In the Garden of Gethsemane, before his arrest and before he was uh, persecuted and then was uh, nailed on the cross, he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, was praying to the God the Father. And let's look at this passage. Matthew chapter 26, verses 30, uh, 37 to 39. And this is uh, the time of the last, the last time that Jesus had this freedom on his own before he was arrested. And so in Matthew chapter 26, verses 37 tells us, he took Peter and the two sons of Jebedee, that's John and James, these three, the, the inner circle of Jesus' group, Peter, James and John, along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. But sadly, we know that the, the disciple fall asleep. Going a little further, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. You know, this is the first time that Jesus expressed his deepest emotion. You know, these few verses 
are loaded with heavy emotional word. Here talking about, you know, begin to be sorrowful and troubled. You know, Jesus, when he come to the earth, he was like all of us, perfect man and perfect God. So he felt the sorrow, he felt the pain and the agony that he will go through by crucify on the cross. And therefore, he said to the disciples, hey, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Can you imagine Jesus expressing to his inner circle, this Peter, James and John? You know, he said, my, my, my soul, deep down in my soul, is, 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 is engulfed you know, with sorrow, with pain, to the point of death. Therefore, in the Luke uh, Gospel, and uh, it recorded that Jesus was so sorrowful and it was so painful that you know his uh, his his uh, sweat uh, like a drop of blood on the on 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 the, on the ground. Can you imagine? Jesus was so sad, and he needed more support from these three disciples, and yet they fall asleep. And so, by going a little a little further, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed. Was, Jesus was so sorrowful he could, he, he could not even stand and pray. He fell to the ground and prayed, and my Father, if it is possible, what does it mean? Like he was pleading to the Father in heaven, just like a child come to his father, oh, daddy, daddy, please help me. So Jesus was crying out to the Father, Father, if it is possible, if there is another way to accomplish your will to save the humankind, if there is another way, if there is another Choices that I can make to save the world. Please let this cup be away from me, be taken from me. What is this cup referring to? That is a cross. That is a separation of the Son of God with the God the Father. It was that cross, the bitter cup. If it is possible, if there is other way, may this cup be taken from me. And then Jesus left the choice with the Father. Yet, not as I will, but as you will. Well, I always think that this is the greatest prayer that we can ever learn from our Lord Jesus Christ. It is okay for us to express our desire, you know, what we want, you know, or what we need to our Lord Jesus Christ and to God. But remember to add this phrase, not as I will, but as you will. By saying that Jesus knew in his heart that the Father knows what he is doing. The Father has a perfect plan of salvation for all of us. And therefore, Jesus here, really, he has given up his right. He has forgo his, his right and leaving this choice to the Father in heaven. Remember in John chapter 10, verse 18, the Father already given him the authority to decide what he wants to do to save humankind, to save all of us. But yet Jesus, in this passage, He said, not as I will, but as you will. So the next time when you pray, although you may really desire something that you want it so much, you are pleading, you are crying out to the Lord, as what Jesus did. But remember, it is God who knows what is best for you. Not as I will, but as you will. Will. And you know, Jesus, when he committed that prayer to God the Father, he really gave up the right to save himself. The Father has given him every right and every authority to save himself, to do what he wants to do with his life. Just like, you know, good parents will give the authority, the freedom to the children to do what they see best. But this Child of God, this Son of God, say, not my will, but as you will. So he gave out his right to save himself. How do we know that? You know, when Jesus has prayed a prayer, and not long after that, Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed Jesus, brought a group of people to Garden of Gethsemane because Jesus often prayed in that place. So Judas of, of course, knew that place, so he brought a group of people and come to the garden and to arrest Jesus. You know what happened? Read on in Matthew chapter 26, verses 51 to 53. With that, we mean that before that, the Judas with a group of people, one of, Jesus, uh, one of Jesus' companions reached for his sword, drew it out and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. 
And uh, in the Gospel of John tells us it was Peter. Definitely it was Peter, right? Peter, the one who is the very aggressive, the one who is always compulsive. And uh, I think he didn't, he didn't do a good job. He supposed, I think he, he was supposed to kill this servant of the high priest want to arrest Jesus, but he missed that and cut off his ear. And then put, up, put your sword back in his place, Jesus said to him, for all who draw the sword will die by the sword. Do you think I cannot call on my father and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels. What Jesus is saying to Peter is, Peter, thanks, but no thanks. Thanks, but no thanks. Why did Jesus say that? You know, I, sometimes I get very emotional when I, when I read verse 53. Jesus said, do you think I cannot call on my father? That he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels. What Jesus is saying, if I want to save myself, hey, Peter, I don't need your help. I just need to you know, call out my father and at once he's going to send this army of angels. Not just one legion, 12 legions of angels. By the way, do you know how many is 12 legions of angels? Let's do a little bit of calculation. According to the Romans army, one legion of Roman army equal to 6,000 soldiers. One legion of Roman army equal to 6,000 6, Roman soldiers. So I think many of you are good at math, right? So 12 legions of angels equal to how many? 72,000 of angels. They are all at Jesus' disposal. Can you imagine that? All that Jesus needs is just one angel able to make all these people who come and arrest him disappear. But Jesus said, do you, not, do you think that I cannot call on my father? And at once, he will at once put at my disposal more than 72, at least 72,000 of angels. You can imagine, and I always imagine this scene. When Judas come and, uh, and betray Jesus with a kiss and, and, and people begin to surround Jesus and want to arrest Jesus, and all these 72,000 angels up in the sky somewhere with sword drawn. Whenever Jesus have that command or just give a word, any one of those 72 angels will come and strike all those who come and arrest Jesus. That's what Jesus means. The Father has given me the authority, given me the right. That's why I come to this conclusion that the Father still gives him this choice, the right of choice. Whether I want to be arrested, whether I want to continue to go on the cross, or whatever that Jesus may think of doing other way. Therefore, he said that my Father, he will at once put at my disposal. So there must be a conversation between God the Father and God the Son. Hey, in case, after the prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane, in case you change your mind, remember, I have prepared for you 12 legions of angels, 72,000 armies of angels are at your disposal. Wow, when I think of that, I cannot but worship the Lord and our Lord Jesus Christ. He gave up the right to save himself. Why? Because of his love for you and for me. He was perfect without sin, but because of our sin, he has to go through the cross. He had to give out his right in order to save us from our sin. And have you ever done that in your life? in your relationships, giving up right. It's very hard to do. You know that it is your right to be served. It is your right to be in this position, to be in this promotion. But because of greater cause or greater mean, therefore you forgo this right, you give up this right. And if that's a choice for us to give up our right in order to have a better relationship, to have a better result, will you do that? That's what Jesus was doing. Give out his, his right in order to save all of us. This is really true love. That's how God demonstrates his love to us through his son, Jesus Christ. 
And the last point that, as I conclude this message, is we love because Jesus first loved us. We love because Jesus first loved us. Our most basic need is love. It is also our most important need as well. You know, we can imagine a person without love is a person that do not know how to love, do not know how to interact or have a relationship with people around them, even family members, even their colleagues, even their friends. Love is our basic need. But we cannot love until we experience love ourselves. We cannot truly love one another unless we experience the love of Jesus Christ. And how did he love us? You know, in Romans chapter 7 and chapter 5, verses 7 and 8 tells us, say, very rarely will anyone die for the righteous person. Though for the good person, someone might possible dare to die. I think this is a fact, right? Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person. For the good person, maybe for your friends, you know, maybe for your buddy, you say, okay, I might possibly die for him. But verse 9 tells us, in contrast, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Wow. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. What does it mean? While we are still against God, while we are still in our sin, while we are still so self-centered, while we are still so selfish, so prideful, when we are still against God, without knowing this God of love, without knowing this Jesus Christ who has given us His life to save us, that He borne all our suffering on the cross for us, while we do not know all of that yet, God sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to die for us. It's very interesting that we see Jesus Christ did not ask you, hey, you need to change first before I can save you. You need to become a better person before I can save you. Oh, you need to become a good person. You need to do this right first and before I can accept you, before I can receive you into the family of God. No, 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 no. Jesus did not do that. And while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Therefore, we need to learn and how to love one another as Christ has loved us. Love one, love one another with the love of Christ. When you experience the love of Christ, then only you can love people around you. You cannot give to others what you do not have. If you do not have love, how can you love people around you? If you have never experienced the love of Jesus Christ, that sacrificial love, the love that really has, has go all the way out and love us to the end, we cannot love one another because our human love is so limited. Our human, love, our human love is so conditional. But Christ's love is unconditional, unchanging and forever. Remember, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Therefore, love one another with the love of Christ. And sometimes jokingly, you know, me and my wife, and we have, you know, some arguments. And, and uh, so last time we said, hey, when we have that argument and uh, we no longer feel that we can love with one another, we were jokingly say, okay, I'll love you with the love of Christ. Now I can only love you with the love of Christ because my own love is already out. I run out of my own love for you. I need the love of Christ and so that I can love you with the love of Christ. And this is what Jesus Christ commands us in John chapter 13, verses 34 to 35. A new command I give you, love one another. Oh, beside this greatest commandment, Jesus gave us this new commandment. That's only through Jesus Christ, not through the Old Testament law, but the New Testament, Jesus Christ said, a new command I give you, love one another. And the very important verse that I underline here is, as I have loved you. Underline that, highlight that in your Bible. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. What does as I have loved you mean? What, I'm, what Jesus means is the 
basis of our love for one another should be based upon how the Lord Jesus Christ loved us. How did Christ love us? Without asking us to change? Even without asking us to become a better person? Even without asking us to do this and do that? He already loved us unconditionally and unchanging. Maybe at this time your mind begins to think of someone that you find it really hard to love. Maybe your inconsiderate husband or maybe your nagging wife or maybe some you know, brother or sister in the church that always give you trouble. You find it so hard to love them. Let us think for a moment, how would Jesus love my husband? How would Jesus love my wife? How would Jesus love my dear brother and my dear sister? This is as I have loved you means. And then just do according to what the Holy Spirit has put in your heart so that you can dare to love again. So that you can dare to receive others again. So you can dare to forgive others again. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. How much we need to share this with the people around us. People are hurting one another. People are ridiculing one another, criticizing one another. It is all because we have not experienced the love of Jesus Christ. As I have loved you, Jesus said. So you must love one another. And this is really one of the greatest strategies that Jesus has placed in our hearts to change the world. Love can make a better world. Yes, love can make a better world. Love can be, make a better marriage. Love can make a better community. Love can make a better family. Love can really make a better world. But not our human love, but it is a love of Jesus Christ. That's why when we think about the suffering and the death of Jesus Christ during this season of Lent, as we prepare for the Good Friday, we need to remember how Jesus Christ loves us. There are two practical ways that we can show our love. And first of all, by serving one another. By serving one another. Jesus has served us. He came to this world not to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. Serving the people around us. Serving the community. I think you may, you may have heard this example of our food pantry, our River of Life Foundation ministry. And then we have, during this pandemic, you know, we have expanded far and wide our food pantry program. Right now, if I'm not mistaken, we, have, we, we, we are serving well, more than a thousand families. Yeah, more than a thousand families, you know, uh, a month. You know, serving those people from all walks of life that we do not know. Asians, Caucasians, Blacks, and different group of people. And then through the USDA, a food box program, who we have even expanded far and wide. More than 20 churches are joining hand together with us to distribute those food boxes to the community. There are, there are black church, there are white church, there are, there are you know, uh, different ethnic church. They come every week to pick out boxes of food and to give out to the community, to those who are in need. And so by serving one another, even in your family, even in your own community, your neighbor, I still remember during those uh, USDA food box time, I usually pick up about five to six boxes, you know, who did I give to? One neighbor on my left is the uh, African-American family. As I give it to them, they are so happy every time. And they see that, thank you, thank you, Chang, you know, for giving us this uh, food box. And on my right-hand side, on, on our house, is a Korean, uh, Korean single family. So I give one to them. And then across from my house is the Filipinos and uh, family, you know, black, Korean, Filipinos. And I went to another Chinese family. Hey, we are serving the community. They feel the love of Jesus. I say, uh, no, this is really from, from the church. We want to, sh we want to tell you that because we care, we want to share this blessing together with you. So by serving one another, we are making Christ known. That's what Jesus says, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Serving one another is one of the best ways to show your love to the people around us to communicate that love in a very practical way. And then second suggestion is by praying together. By praying together. You know, we see so many hurting communities around us, especially during the pandemic. You know, we see many people are hurting. 
So we need to come together to pray. And praise the Lord, our church is right now is planning for a joint prayer meeting some, sometimes in April, approaching maybe the end of April. We're going to ask all the community and around us, whether it's the uh, black church, the white church, you know, Iranian church, Mexican church, you know, all those churches around us, and we want to gather them together so that we can be united together and pray for our city, pray for our nation, and pray for God's peace and love to come and reign and rule in our hearts. My dear brothers and sisters, Christ has indeed suffered and died for us on the cross. And now He commands us to do is, as I have loved you, that you must love one another. There's no better way for us to show our gratitude to all that Christ has done for us is to obey His new command. That is to love one another so that we can make this world a better world. We can make our community a better community. We can make our city a better city. Amen? Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for this season of Lent that we can meditate on the suffering and the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. Father, we thank you for your sacrifice, for giving out your right, and so that we can be set free, for dying on the cross so that we can be reconciled back to God. And by demonstrating how you love us and so that we can love one another. During this time of confusions and time of pain and hurt, Father, may the love of Christ once again fill every heart as we begin to love one another, as we share our love in a very practical way, by serving, by praying, by accepting, and so that the world, the people around us, will know that we are your disciples because we have loved one another. Give us this power and the strength to love, even starting with our family members, with our neighbours and our communities. Father, we thank you, we praise you. We give you praise, glory and honour. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Chang, for that message. This concludes our Sunday service. As always, if you need prayer, our prayer team is waiting in the Zoom link down below. Other than that, have a great week and God bless.